All right, good morning, everyone. Good day to be in school. I know you're a little bit excited about today because, you know, you get three, well, you get a couple of days off after this. So I hope you get all the rest that you need on your fall break. But we have a really uh, special chapel panel discussion uh, this morning. And uh, Mr. Hunter has scheduled four of these throughout the year. This is our first one. We got some great guests to come in. I really appreciate these men. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and you guys get to know them a little bit better and why they're here going to share on this topic. But uh, I've already met with them and kind of discussed how we're going to run this day. So super excited to have them, super thankful that they're taking the time out of their schedule to be here because they think the topic is important and because they want to share it with you. So just give them all your attention this morning. We're just going to have really a, a very very profitable, profitable time. I and mean, when you're thinking through it, you're listening at the end, some of the Q&A questions, think about things you could ask them, and uh, they'd be glad to just uh, pour into, into you this morning there in this chapel. So one little reminder, I'm going to open in prayer. We have a full schedule this morning. Our men's camp out got rained out last week, but it's rescheduled for next week, next Friday. So praying that the weather holds up for as well and the temperatures hold up as well. Looking forward to that time together. So we need those permission forms, slips for the guys who would like to go. There again, we have a big schedule there for you. I encourage you to be a part of that. We've already shared quite a bit, just reminding you that we've changed those dates to a Friday, the 14th, a week from this coming Friday. All right? So let's go open up more to prayer, and we'll start out with our music this morning. Let's pray. Father, what a wonderful time it is, even in today's society, to, to have the Word of God that anchors us in truth. In Ephesians 4, it talks about being tossed around by all teaching and doctrine. And Lord, we're thankful that we can turn to your Word and in your Word not be tossed around, but find an anchor sure and true. I thank you for these men that have taken time out of their busy to come here out of love for you, out of love for truth, and love for these students. So bless our time this morning, Lord. May it bring glory to you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, you can go ahead and take a seat. Let me introduce our first kind of guest that's going to come up now. This is Pastor Brandon Reed. If you guys want to give him a welcome here, maybe. Yeah. No, he's good. He's got a mic. So Brandon is a good friend of mine. He's an elder at Christ Covenant Fellowship in town. He also works for the Liberty University School of Divinity. Um, and he's just been a really faithful, solid brother in Christ. And I'm just thankful for him that he took time out of his schedule to come here. You guys are going to the camp out. He's also planning to be there with us, which would be great. great. So we got to get a two for one on it, which is awesome. And so he's going to kind of open up our subject today for about 10 minutes or so. Then we're going to sing another song and get into our Q&A. Okay, so pay attention. Hopefully this gets your brain moving. And then we'll be able to move forward into our question and answer in just a bit. All right. Hey, Jacob, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for the invitation for allowing me to be a part of this event this morning. Uh, this is an incredibly crucial topic for us to discuss. So I am so glad that you chose to bring this panel to be. And to have this discussion with these students, again, I think it's crucial, uh, especially considering our current social, political, cultural landscape. It's necessary that we have this conversation. So as we begin this conversation, I think it's first important for us to clearly define terms. The terms that we use matter. So we want to talk about racism, wokeness, and the Imago Dei. But what I wanted to focus on with these first few minutes as we open this conversation is the idea of wokeness. That's a word that we hear thrown around quite a bit these days. But what is wokeness? What does it mean? What is it exactly? What we need to understand is that wokeness is indeed a world view. Those who hold to the tenets and subscribe to its assertions have a particular lens through which they see the world, race, society, all of these other things. More importantly, we need to understand what makes wokeness so dangerous, specifically to Christians and to the church. You see, their teachings are unbiblical as it pertains to race and sin and salvation and repentance and all of these other things. The entire basis for the foundation or ideology of wokeness is actually antithetical. That means it's contrary to what the Bible actually teaches us. So what is wokeness? 
What is wokeness? Well, wokeness means a person is awake to the true nature of the world. You see, the woke claim to see the world for what it really is, where they claim that others don't have the eyes to see the world this way. And quite frankly, at its core, wokeness sees the world through race-colored glasses. It suggests that the whole of society is based on these racial power dynamics. It has its roots in Marxist ideology. And so therefore, the woke, they categorize people in two ways. There's the oppressed and then there's the oppressor. And what they'll claim is that every institution, every organization, every system has been intentionally structured in a way to advantage one group of people at the disadvantage and the expense of another group of people. You see, proponents for wokeness and advocates for critical race theory refer to this as systemic oppression. You see, wokeness views everyone according to a particular construct. They look at everyone according to the category of race. And somehow they manage to assert that one race specifically, one particular skin color of people is just inherently wrought with racism. You see, wokeness claims that sin is exclusive to one sin color, particularly the woke claim the sin of racism is exclusive to the white race or to white skin color. They claim that all white people, simply by virtue of being white, are guilty of the sin of racism. This goes beyond an assumption. They argue that this is an indisputable fact. Furthermore, if you are a white person, not only are you inherently guilty of the sin of racism, the woke claim there's no real solution to the issue. See, there's no forgiveness to this sin of racism. There's no grace in the woke ideology. All you can hope to do is acknowledge your sin and your racist attitudes or to wake up or to go woke to how you are inherently sinful as a white person. And the best you can do is participate in continuous acts of penance and repentance. Your only hope is to engage in the battle against racism and whiteness. You have to become what the woke call an anti-racist. See, according to the woke, it's not enough to simply not be racist. It's not enough for you to just love your neighbor, to treat your neighbor with dignity, respect, and care. In fact, the woke claim if you are white, that's not a possibility for you. You're only and always guilty of racism, even if you join the fight and march with the cause. You're still inherently guilty of the sin of racism. But you see, when we measure this woke ideology against the word of God, I believe it's easy for us to see the danger in this, why this is so problematic to the church. You see, wokeness holds to an unbiblical and really an unrealistic view of race. See, wokeness would suggest that there is something biologically or genetically unique about races particularly the white race, which inclines white people to somehow just be inherently racist. But this denies the fundamental teaching of scriptures as it pertains to the subject of race. And it's important for us as God's people, for everyone in this room that says you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we have to look at race the way that God looks at race. It's important that we say what God says about mankind and humanity. So if we want to have a foundational understanding about race and humanity, we begin by looking at Genesis chapter 1. And Genesis 1:27 says this, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, both male and female, he created them. You see, this is the appropriate lens through which we must view humanity, that all people are created in the image of God. Therefore, there is no distinction. Every human being, regardless of their race, and the reason I say race, and we'll get to that in a minute, but that's not a legitimate term. The actual term that we should use is ethnicity. We want to make sure we have a biblical understanding of humanity, and we'll get to that in just a minute. 
But Genesis 1.27 tells us that human beings, regardless of their race or ethnicity, all bear the image of God. Now, why is this germane to our conversation? Well, this verse shows us that there is no fundamental difference between human beings. You see, this verse levels the playing field. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in just a minute. But this verse is essential to us understanding the commonality of mankind. You see, this is where we begin to have a biblically accurate understanding of race. See, though this verse is indeed an adequate place for us to start, we can't stop there. God has much more to say about race and ethnicity. He has more to say to us on this issue. So as we continue the conversation and we narrow our view a little bit more and begin to drill down on the idea of race and ethnicity, one of the key verses that we must go to, and I'll say this is a go-to verse in these conversations, is Acts 17, 26. And this verse is so crucial to understanding anthropology, to understanding humanity. Acts 17, 26 says this, And he, that he is God, says, And God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined and allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place. That verse is crucial. It's key to us understanding the conversation around race and ethnicity. Because this verse helps to establish a common origin for all human beings. See, we are not separate races, or as some would argue, separate acts of creation. This again gives us a biblical anthropology. The text says from one man, or you could translate that one blood, from one blood, God creates every nation to dwell and populate the earth. This is our common ancestry. And there are no separate races. We simply have different outward appearances, specifically the amount of melanin one possesses or doesn't possess. Otherwise, we share an origin. We share a biology. And most importantly, what we all share is our sin nature, right? However, wokeness denies one of the fundamental tenets of the Christian faith, and that is that sin runs through each and every one of us. They try to reserve sin exclusively for one group of people, but Romans 3.23, Paul tells us that we all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. See, the Bible never teaches that sin lays on one group of people teaches us that we're all guilty of sin. Furthermore, the Bible never teaches us that skin color is sinful. There's nothing inherently wicked about a person's skin. The Bible teaches us that sin and wickedness flows from the human heart. See, Matthew 15, 19, Jesus says this, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. See, Jesus here points to the root of the issue. It is a heart issue. It's not a skin issue. It's not about ethnicity. Ethnicity isn't sinful. Human beings are sinful. Our hearts are wicked. See, this is the problem, again, with Wokeness as they deny even the most fundamental biblical teachings. See, ethnic hatred or what we'll call racism is a disposition of the heart. And it's no more offensive or worthy of God's judgment than any other sin would be. But see, the woke claim that this is the unforgivable sin. There's no getting over this one. Again, the best you could do is just acknowledge it and move on. So you can't be saved. You can't be forgiven of the sin of racism. And that's not what the Bible teaches us. See, to deny a person's ability to be saved and forgiven is to really deny and compromise the gospel. See, wokeness has no liberation. There's no freedom for those who have been deemed guilty according to this worldly ideology. Not even in Christ do they claim that a person can be 
forgiven and made new. But the Bible clearly teaches us something contrary. Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. There's no caveat to that. There's no qualified statement that comes after. Paul doesn't say the salvation to all who believe unless you're white or unless you're guilty of the sin of racism. No, to all who believe, there's freedom in Jesus Christ. So as we prepare to kind of close this conversation and begin another one as we move into our panel. I just want to remind you of another essential verse. You see, Paul issues a warning against structures like wokeness when he writes in Colossians 2 verse 8. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to to Christ. Friends, this is the danger of wokeness. It is an empty ideology. It is a broken philosophy. It is an unbiblical teaching that is contrary to all that the word of God teaches us. And the reason that Jacob puts this panel together and wants to have this conversation with you guys, the reason that me and the rest of these speakers give up some time on a Wednesday morning to come in here is because we want you to say what God says about race and ethnicity. We don't want you to be captured by worldly philosophies. There's nothing sinful about skin color. Amen, somebody. That's why we want to have these conversations. So we're going to go into a time where we have a discussion and you guys will be able to ask some questions. And we want to further and dive deeper into this subject. But again, we want you to understand and see the world, see race, ethnicity, people, humanity, through the lens of what God says. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, I just thank you. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this time, for being able to have this conversation. We look forward to uh, the conversations that will arise out of this gathering. Uh, Lord, I just pray that we would be people who maintain a foundation that is built on the word of God that we say what you have said about humanity, about sin, about salvation and repentance and mankind. Lord, I pray for these students. Pray that they wouldn't be taken by the world and convinced otherwise. But they would be faithful to what you have said. That there would be those who study diligently the word of God and look at the world appropriately through the lens that you've given them through your written and revealed word. God, just bless our time. I pray that mo most of all, Christ will be glorified in this time. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. All right, I'm asking my panel guests to come on up. We're running a little bit behind, but that's totally fine. Paul, is this one on? Good. As they're coming up, let me at least just introduce who we've got. So you guys have already met Brandon now. Um, and then we have uh, Mr. Michael Laurie, he's a pastoral assistant at Timberlake Baptist. He works with a lot of you guys in the home next door for international students. Um, and he uh, actually produced a paper for our church. It's like a position paper on, um, on the, the, the issues of wokeness, racism, all that sort of stuff. So we're really helpful, lots of research, which should be good for us. And we have Dr. Ben Eswine, um, who is a history professor at Liberty. Um, he's very helpful for this conversation because all the stuff you're seeing in the culture, whether it's wokeness, critical race theory, actual racism itself, it all has historical roots. And so he can kind of show us where that comes from. And then we have Tyler Goins, who was a former student of mine actually a long time ago, um, but he's now actually leading the youth ministry at Christ Covenant Fellowship. Just has a remarkable testimony you guys will hear next week um, and just really helpful resource on this topic as well. All right, so let's go right into some of our questions. Um, so we're going to go through a few questions that we have here to kind of get the ball rolling for what we're going to talk about. Then I have a little bit of at least one pre-submitted question I want to look at, and then hopefully we'll have time for some live Q&A. Okay, so we're going to try to be as quick as we can, try to address as much as we can, but at least get you guys' minds thinking about these things, okay? First question from Michael, what are biblical definitions of race and racism? So biblical definitions of race and racism. You should be able to grab a mic there from the end. Is it not there? Yeah, sorry. There you go. All right, thank you, Jacob. 
So biblical definitions of race and racism. Uh, Brandon did an excellent job giving us uh, the contrast between sort of woke ideology and the Christian worldview. Um, so let's tackle racism. Um, quick review, he, he did it really well. What, under woke, um, wokeness, woke ideology, what is racism? It is not referring to individual acts as we would think of it. It's, it's talking about a system that has been constructed for the advantage of one group over another. And that's why it's, it divides people. You're either oppressed or an oppressor. You're, you're in one of those groups. Um, so it's not talking about individual acts. That is crucial to get. What is racism, according to the Bible? It is, has nothing to do with your group identity. It has to do with individual acts, right? So in the under wokeness, you cannot not be racist, right? Because you're participating in that system if you're in that oppressor group. And you cannot be racist if you're in a, an, an oppressed group. The Bible says it is individual actions, individual um, thoughts and intentions of the heart. So it's a bi biblically defined, we're not going to see the word racism in the Bible. It's an extra biblical term, but the Bible has a lot to say about it. I would say first, it is cursing another made in the image of God, James 2, in doing so on the basis of something as superficial as skin color. Cursing another made in the image of God. The other thing it is, it is hate. Hate desires the harm or tearing down of another person. Again, doing so on the basis of skin color, something superficial. Um, I hate another person. And then it's the sin of partiality. Um, I'm being partial. I give advantage. Again, in James, we see the example of a rich and a poor. Hey, come you, sit up here. You, go sit down there. Right? It's partiality. Um, so in favoritism uh, to one group as opposed to another. It has nothing to do with your group identity. It has to do with your individual actions. Um, so I would say that's a biblical definition of, of racism. And it's built on a biblical understanding of race, which is ethnicity. We're not fundamentally different. We are fundamentally the same, deep down. Same problem, same purpose, same nature, and a same problem and the same solution for, for every one of us. Um, very good. That's very good. So we've talked a lot already about this idea of systemic racism. We're going to get to that in just a little bit. But sometimes I think when you start speaking against ideas like wokeness, you can sound like you're saying, well, I don't believe racism can ever be real. Does racism ever happen? Now, again, we might not use the term. We might say something more like ethnic hatred or something like that. But just to ask Brandon here, kind of in contrast to what you just shared with us, is racism real? Does it still happen today? Check one, two. Yep. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Racism is real. Um, and I thought Mike did a great job explaining that that's an individual act. So what we would call racism, I would define as ethnic hatred. And why would I do that? Um, I'll go back to the verse I shared a little while ago from Acts 17, 26, uh, where it says from one man, he made every nation. Well, the Greek word used there for nation is uh, ethnos, which is where we get the word ethnicity. So actually, if we want to be biblically accurate, the word shouldn't even be race. The word that we use is ethnicity. There's only one race. That's the human race. Now, we have different ethnicities. We look different. We have a different appearance based on where my ancestors resided on the globe and where your ancestors resided on the globe in relation to the equator or the poles. We're going to look a little bit different on our skin color. However, as Mike also pointed out, we're all inherently the same. We're all biologically the same. There's one race as we have one uh, origin, uh, descendants of Adam. So if we talk about racism, it's what we'll call ethnic hatred. And yes, that does happen. There are individuals who have that disposition in their heart to say that my ethnicity is greater than yours or superior to yours. So we do see racism happening consistently. Now, what we need to remember is that racism doesn't always transpire the way that we think it does, the way that the media portrays it. Some of the things that you guys are being fed, that we're all being fed, uh, through these news outlets, through these social media outlets, what they'll call racism may not actually be racism. So just because you see an incident that involves a white officer and a black assailant, you can't necessarily deem that as a racist act immediately. First of all, because you're not God, so you can't see a person's heart, right? God judges the heart. So we can't fall into that trap, but I think that's what we do. Second of all, I'll say that um, which I guess we'll get to that in a little bit. So I'm actually going to hold off on that. I was going to talk a little bit about systemic racism, but 
that's something I'll let, I believe, Ben, you're going to discuss that, so I'm going to let you have the floor on that one. But, yes, racism is real. Yes, it does happen. But, again, that's a disposition of the heart. Those are individual acts. So even if, I will say this, even if there was a system in place that specifically oppressed people of a certain ethnicity, it couldn't exist if there weren't wicked men who held those dispositions to create those systems. So again, the place to start isn't with fixing the system, it's to change a man's heart. And that only happens with the power of the gospel. Actually, let's, let's go ahead and go forward then to, to Tyler, then maybe on that question of systemic racism. So you hear that term, I don't know if you've heard it before, basically we're talking about the idea that in our culture, ingrained in the way that we think that there are, there's, it, there's racism that we can't avoid, and so the, the cult, all the institutions of the culture have to be overthrown. We have to get rid of it. Heard a lot during 2020, that sort of stuff. Tyler, is systemic racism, racism a real problem we should be concerned with? What do you think? Um, so first we have to define systemic racism. What, what is systemic racism? Systemic racism is ethnic hatred that is embedded so deeply within a society or an organization that all minorities can say that they are victims of uh, this ethnic hatred that takes away opportunities that in the United States white people would have, but minorities wouldn't. Um, and as Christians, we have to hold to a biblical worldview. So holding to a biblical worldview, we have to look at truth. So I've defined systemic racism. Should we be worried about it and is it a real problem? Uh, First, you know, we, how many black millionaires, judges, cops, all these black, Mexican, whatever it is, how many millionaires do we have in the United States? If the United States was a country that is set up to put minorities under, why are these people so successful? Secondly, why are they able to stand in front of these news outlets in front of a country that is supposed to oppress them and call out the oppression without being crushed. That's a great point. Uh, what was the other thing? Oh, and then to go towards what Brandon was saying about uh, my um, police brutality, in 2019, a Washington Post database of police shootings says this, 14 unarmed black victims in comparison to the 25 unarmed white victims were victims of um, police brutality. But the media only covered the blacks, black victims, because that's all they want you to know about, because they're pushing that agenda. Uh, so should we be worried about it? Is it a real problem? I wouldn't say it's a real problem in the United States, uh, but should we be worried about it? I would say yes, not that it's a problem, but that we should, we should worry about what listening to these ideas may cause in us. Are we being partial to others as a result of holding to these ideas? Are we forming our own hate in our hearts? Are we being racist towards others just because of a false idea that has been pushed on us? Uh, and that's what I would say. So, so you're saying basically, if systemic racism could, racism could exist, there's not much evidence to see anything like that in our culture anyway. Yeah. That's a great a, point. Yeah. There's a bunch more uh, studies that but to save time, I just named off those two. Yeah, that's good. All right, so let's go to, let's go to Ben here. Um, and let's talk a little bit about, so we've talked a little bit about how racism is a real thing. People hate other people based purely on the color of their skin. That does happen. And we've talked about that there are these current woke ideologies which take racism to this whole nother level, talking about it as though you're inherently racist, that sort of thing. So can you give us maybe a brief overview of where the historic roots are of both sides of that kind of, of, of equilibrium we see there, where both sides are. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, since I'm in academia, I deal with ideas and I deal with what's supposed to be logical and rational and reasonable, uh, and ultimately then uh, race or racism is something that is not any of those. It's, it's something emotional, something connected to uh, very specific experiences and there's always a disconnect between ideas and then the reality on the ground the experiences that you have and so uh, what we see is that a lot of uh, these uh, terms that you've heard critical race theory social justice uh, these ideas uh, even black lives matter uh, they actually have ideological ac academic uh, 
components that they are founded upon that don't always necessarily match up with what you see on the ground uh, in your own life experientially. Uh, and so they're trying to bridge that gap and they do that through race specifically, but their core roots actually go back into the 19th century uh, and into several different components that came out of the 19th century uh, particularly in, uh, in Europe, uh, and specifically from the works of Karl Marx. You've probably heard of Karl Marx, right, most of you? Uh, and uh, also uh, Charles Darwin and, and the emergence of what's known as social Darwinism. Uh, and so uh, what essentially happened was with the birth of the United States and the Declaration of Independence, when Thomas Jefferson wrote down that all men are created equal, uh, that's like the cat was out of the bag at that point. Uh, it changed everything. Uh, and as soon as that happened, you had to therefore start justifying your treatment of other people when you were treating people less than yourself. Uh, and ultimately that meant justifying slavery. Why slavery had been around since the foundations of civilization. In fact, uh, some of the first records we have is actually uh, on slaves. So uh, that's been around since the beginning. The term slave itself refers to the Europeans, the Slavs, right, who were actually uh, brought as slaves by the Vikings into the Middle Eastern markets uh, of the Byzantine Empire and of uh, the Arabic caliphates. So uh, what ended up happening is in the 19th century, people started going, oh, we've got to justify these institutions that exist that are inherently divisive, have, have divided us among those was slavery. And slavery, therefore, was justified uh, by works like Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, right? You've heard of that, published right before the Civil War, actually. Uh, and uh, it was uh, actually the full title. Anybody know the full title to that work? It's if you go, go to the original page of its publication, and Charles Darwin's original work is titled On the Origin of Species or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life, right? Now, who do you think he thought were the favored races, right? Uh, so even at the beginning of Darwinist ideology, there was a clear hierarchy of we're going to try to justify that white people are superior to all other cultures, essentially trying to justify the fact that they were at the top of, of, the, of the social strata at that time. Uh, and so what ends up happening uh, is you have this social Darwinism is this concept of trying to divide society into groups that, of, of important people, uh, good people, good genes, good genetics, good good breeding and those who don't. Uh, and ultimately that led to all sorts of, of evils including the Holocaust and, and Nazism uh, and, and even uh, certain aspects of, of the gulags in, in, in communist countries too. So that's one aspect. The other aspect comes from Karl Marx, like we, we talked about, uh, which said specifically that Marx, uh, Marx was saying that everything is about class struggle. Uh, and so for him, he saw uh, the divide in society not being necessarily based upon race, although Marx himself had some very nasty things to say about uh, Jews and black people. Specifically, if you read his writings, he was not a nice man when it came to those uh, groups that he kind of categorized as uh, not intelligent in his opinion. Uh, but ultimately, uh, he also said uh, that class struggle is the most important. Those people who are rich and wealthy are on top, and those who uh, are poor, hardworking, they're more virtuous, that they're at the bottom, that shouldn't be, we should do something to fix that, and therefore we need to change uh, the economic structure of society. So what you do is you end up finding, when you start digging into the roots of things like social justice, like uh, Black Lives Matter, like critical race theory, is you start seeing all of these components that I just talked about are there. When you look at, for instance, Black Lives Matter, they talk about on their website, uh, and I remember seeing this for the first time when I, I was interested in figuring out what this movement was, that they want to abolish the family. Uh, they, say, they said that specifically on their website. We want to get rid of the family structure. It's oppressive, they said. Uh, well, first off, that has nothing to do with what they were supposed to be doing in the first place, which is addressing uh, violence between police and, and you know, police brutality. Uh, but secondly, that is directly from 
uh, the second chapter of the Communist Manifesto. It comes directly from Karl Marx, who says specifically, we want to abolish the family, because he saw it as indicative of the structure of class struggle. Uh, and he included among that a breakdown in education in order to do that. In other words, you've got to dumb people down and make education essentially about teaching socialism. And that's it. Nothing else matters. Just teaching socialism and socialist propaganda. Uh, otherwise, we need to get rid of all education because it's bourgeois. It's capitalistic. It's part of the system. right? Uh, so all of this was connected to these attacks against Jefferson's statements in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. And think about that, that the founding fathers of the country knew that we were all created in the image of God and that we were all created equally in his image. That's a powerful statement that is biblically based uh, as opposed to these other men who are making things uh, according to their standards of trying to divide people into particular classes and groups. It's very good. It's very good. It's a lot there. I feel like I just learned like so many things and I have like so many thoughts. So we've, we've discussed at least at length the reality that, that racism or ethnic hatred does exist. People have scientifically justified it in the past. It works like Charles Darwin. And that there is this phenomenon of wokeness. And we could talk about terms like critical race theory, intersectionality. I don't know if we have time to really define those at the moment because I want to get to some student questions here. But these ideas, and they all link back to this guy, Karl Marx, in a lot of ways. And it's the idea that there's the, the systems are what's wrong, not the people, essentially, right? Um, so I hope maybe at this point, maybe some of you guys might have some questions. Does anybody have a question they want to ask related to what we've talked about at all? Oh, we got some. Here we go. All right. Let's, uh, Mr. Payne, if you don't mind, we'll... I think I saw Jake's hand over here first. Can we try him real quick right over here? And then we'll go to McKinsey next. So let's start, let's go to Jake right back here. How does uh, Nazism and communism tie into racism? Great question. So Nazism and communism, how does that tie to racism? Can you give us okay. like a, a minute on that? <laughs> that that's, that's a, a long topic. Question. That's a big one. Uh, I, w I would say that the best way to say is that there are ideologies that replace God with a man-centered view of how to fix the problems in society. Uh, and specifically by taking, uh, taking aspects of government or of institutions and using them to try to force people into categories where they can then control them and make them better. Uh, and so to that extent, uh, they're, they're very authoritarian uh, in, in their outlook. Marx himself uh, said from the beginning that this was going to, he wanted a revolution that was going to make a society that was from the top down, that these authorities on the top were going to force people bloodily if necessary, there's blood's going to have to be shed if necessary to achieve the ends that he was looking for. Nazism ultimately uh, tries to establish a very similar fascistic order where, th again, there is uh, a group that is essentially uh, on top through strength alone uh, and forcing everybody else to, to follow their pattern. So in both cases, you're talking about authoritarian uh, and man-oriented systems. That's a very good answer. All right, let's go to McKenzie here at a question right in the front. We'll go to her next. Do you think the Black Lives Matter like riots were really like necessary to like for racism? Like, right yeah, I'll, I'll okay. field that one. Well, my question or my response would be a question to to you or to anybody really is, what was accomplished in those riots, right? What was really solved? If you're a person who subscribes to the uh, Black Lives Matter move, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, and you're part of that cause. What are you seeking to accomplish by tearing down and destroying a neighborhood, right? And assaulting businesses, uh, people who have worked hard to establish these establishments. Like, what are you seeking to accomplish? 
So when we talk about Black Lives Matter, and I thought Ben did a great job of explaining that, they do have an agenda. And in fact, uh, the three women who founded Black Lives Matter have uh, openly and publicly admitted that they are trained Marxists. So they have an agenda, as he said, to destroy the nuclear family. Uh, Black Lives Right, they're not subtle about it. They are very open about their agenda. And so they uh, operate under the guise that, hey, we're just trying to fight for uh, justice, right? We want to see uh, equality amongst the races. We want to see uh, officers, uh, police forces uh, treat everyone the same, which is fine and a noble cause, but that's not actually what we're doing. Right? And furthermore, you've really only put the shoe on the other foot. If you feel like you're facing violence in your community, from police authorities, what are you accomplishing by then going into that said community and now destroying it and burning it to the ground? And the unfortunate reality is that there are a lot of people who I want to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that, hey, man, they have well intentioned. They are well intentioned, right? They do want to see what they call equality, right, and equity uh, among the races. But the only problem with that is that that's not even a biblical principle. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that we will have equitable outcomes. In fact, Jesus says the poor you will always have amongst you. But nowhere is it ever taught that everyone's going to have the same of everything, right? My neighbor has three vehicles to my one. Does that mean I should go burn his house down so he should give me one of his cars so we can be even? That's not a biblical principle. Matter of fact, that's not even logical or reasonable. So I would say that a lot of those riots were just, it, it, it's, they didn't really accomplish anything, right? It's, it's unnecessary. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's a great point. They broke commandments. Yeah, it's yeah. sinful behavior, honestly. Yeah, that's very good. All right, we have time for one more student question. I see so many hands down. It's so good. We'll try to get to it. Let's do this. We'll do right over here because you've got your hand up for a while, right in the back here, uh, Mr. Payne. And then we'll go over here to right over here to Mr. King. He's got his hand up. He's ready. He's ready. All right, so we'll go there, and then we'll go there, and then we'll be done. And I'm uh, sure these guys will at least hang out for a couple minutes afterward, and they can quickly answer anything. And we have all peer to peer next week, so we'll talk about it more. So it's great. So here. I had a question about so wokeness affects like who you want to be with for these people who believe in it and stuff. And it's like, I wonder if some of these people, because I'm sure some people who are woke, they go to church, but it's like, they only have like, they only say, oh, you have to be like this color to go to this church and stuff like that. So I was wondering like, how does this affect the church's ability to be diverse? That's, can I combine with that? Because we actually got a pre-submitted question that was very similar to go along with it, which was how do you handle someone whose beliefs are starting to differ from yours be a believer? So same sort of question, right? How yeah. do churches operate when this is so divisive within the church? Yeah. Can you go for it? Yeah, that'd be great. Good. So we're talking as people are coming into our churches that are subscribing to some of these woke tenets. Yeah. How do we relate to how them? How do we relate to them? The question is authority. What is your authority? Is it my own perspective? Is it my own experience? Is it my own feelings? Or is it the scriptures? That's all we have as, as Christians is the word of God. And if that's our ultimate authority, that is where we're going to. We're going to talk through it. We're going to work through it. Well, what does the Bible say about that? How would the Bible describe that? How does the Bible explain who we are? Um, so bring it back to the word of God, which also comes into the kind of churches we're in. We need to be in healthy churches that, that proclaim the word of God. The only voice that's heard is God's voice, uh, is elevated above man's or, or cultures. Um, so it really comes down to authority. What's your authority? Um, ultimately, is it the whims of the culture or is it the unchangeable word of God? Have you settled there and committed to that? That's so good. Yeah, absolutely. All right, one more question right back here. Two hands up now, he's really ready. All right, Mr. Payne. I'm shaking in my seat. Okay, so uh, uh, can you tell me how to react when someone's being racist? Like, what is the best thing to do? Yeah. So that's the other side of the coin, right? So somebody doesn't subscribe to wokeness, but they're actually like being, they're actually exercising ethnic hatred, right? They're not being... Like, they're not loving as they're supposed to. They're hating you based on your race, your skin color, your ethnicity. 
What do you do? What do we think? Tyler, you think you might have that one? That'd be great. Uh, I got one question. Do you know if this person is saved already or not? You can answer real quick. Uh, like, like um, in this hypothetical scenario, is this person a Christian or is it? I don't know. So, uh, so, all right. so I would say I don't know if they're if, saved or not. So I got you. So I would say if this person does hold to a Christian belief, then you would challenge him with scripture. If he, if this person does not hold to a Christian belief, then you would share the gospel with them. That, that's that simple. That's the answer. Yeah, that's it. That's good. It's really good. Or you could even, if they're not a believer, right, as Ben reminded us of constitution, right? Like, what, is the, uh, what does it say that we're all created equal? You could even point them there, right? I think when we talk about this conversation, one of the things that uh, we didn't get to talk about was, like, just the establishment of separate and different races, uh, the, who we call the father of scientific racism is a gentleman named Samuel Morton who studied craniums, right? He studied the size of people's skulls, right? And then he separated them into races that way. Well, that was used to further uh, the support of slavery, right? In recent years, all of his findings have been debunked. There is no separation of races. There's only one race. So I would say to your friend, like, you don't have the right to treat me as less than because even science would tell you that we're equals, that we're created the same. Really good. All right, so just one last question just for Michael to kind of close this out, and I ask you just to pray after we're done here. Um, so I have the question, how should followers of Jesus understand and interact with these modern social justice movements? Basically what I'm asking is, what is biblical justice? What's the justice we should be looking for? And where do we look to see that justice displayed? Mm -hmm. Good. So what is biblical justice versus social justice? So quickly, social justice, tag on with a bin. Very simply, how would you describe social justice? It's redistributive justice. We're distributing privileges and things like that so everybody has equal outcomes. We all have the same number of cars, same advantages, whatever it is. Biblical justice is not redistributive, it is retributive. So it's retributive. It is paying back, rewarding, or punishing based on individual acts of merit or, or demerit. So um, again, social justice, biblical justice would condemn it because you're not only wrong for showing partiality to the rich, you're wrong for showing partiality to the poor. Um, so biblical justice is retributive. So what is injustice according to the Bible? Justice is a big deal. What is it? Things like bribery or extortion or bearing false witness or doing any number of those things to advantage oneself on the disadvantage of another person. And it can be committed by anybody, no matter what group or what class you are, you are in. So that's biblical justice, and it's a big deal. Um, so guard yourself. It is a, it's important. What is the solution? The solution is the gospel. All social justice can do, wokeness can do, is stir up more hatred and uh, more, more division. That's all the world has. It sees there's a problem in society. The world knows things aren't as they should be, but they don't have the lenses of Scripture to rightly interpret it and to give right solutions to it. And all it can do is stir up more division and hatred. Only the gospel, people coming to know the forgiveness of sins through Christ alone, the change of heart by the Holy Spirit, can we be unified can make the most brutalist of enemies into reconciled foes at the foot of the cross. Only the gospel can do that. Um, so rest in the power. We don't need to go out and do social transformation movements. We don't need to go march and fight as the world fights. Trust in the power of the gospel. Speak it. Don't be ashamed of it. And let God do the work. Um, so, I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for your amazing grace. Lord, none of us are smarter than another. Anything we have is your mercy. If we trust your word, it's because of your grace. If we have faith in Christ, it's your grace. And I thank you for your mercy to us. I thank you for the hope in Christ and forgiveness of sins and hope of eternal life. Father, I pray for the students that you would help them to think with great clarity, guard us from the winds of the world which would blow us here and there, keep us anchored in the word of God, that we would be useful tools of you, faithful servants, lights shining in the darkness. And it's all for the glory of Christ and what he's accomplished. Um, thank you, Lord, for your, your goodness in this time that we've had together. I say you bless it, cause it to bear fruit. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, you guys, if you want to pick up your chairs, take them to the back. These guys will be around for at least a couple minutes here. I know they have to get run into. they got stuff to do. But you can come grab them. And again, be thinking over what you have to talk about. You can even send your thoughts to me. We'll get it in the guide for peer-to-peer -peer next week, and we'll be able to discuss more. Also, Tyler will be back with us next week for peer-to-peer -to, -peer to share his testimony a little bit as well. Thank you, guys.